Hello, hello, and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. As has now become traditional, we've reached since we've reached a um, a major milestone in the game. That is, we built we built our first space elevators. I've decided it would be a good idea to uh, produce a, a sort of a quick video giving you an, a summary and an overview of how things have gone up up to this point. So, as is fairly traditional with Factorio, we started off with a main bus design. That's where you have lots of belts r running along the uh, the middle of your base, carrying all of the basic resources you're using, and you sort of and you make things off the bus. So, for example, what, what's a good example? A good example is here, where we're making inserters. We're bringing in all the various things you need. They're coming along the bus, then they're being split off, brought up to, uh, up over here, and then turned into whatever we need. So we're making stack inserters and filter stack inserters and so on. Some of the things are things like these motors here that we make from the bus and then feed back onto the bus because they're needed in large quantities by other things further down the system as well. So. The idea is that as you build this up, you get all of the, all the bits and pieces you need, get put together, and and are fed down the fed down the bus, and you have everything you need further on to build more and more stuff. Now that's a very simple concept, and I'm sure everyone who's going to be watching a video on space exploration is already familiar with how a main bus works. So yes, we start off with one of those. It's it's fairly wide. We've got quite a lot of different resources on it, but we've tried to keep it at least vaguely sane. And as always, we've got the sort of the gap set up like this, so you can run your underground belt straight through the middle of them. The next step with a, with a main bus design is when you realise that some of the things you're using have got far too high a throughput for you to realistically make them on the bus. And usually, the first thing that ha that happens with is probably going to be your um, your metal smelting. So we were doing that over here, and then we moved it off the bus. And the first first thing we did was we moved it over to here. Um, where we set up a sort of a basic uh, smelting system over here. And I think initially we were doing this with the steel furnaces, and that's where you feed in a fuel type and an ore together. And you cook them up and they'll produce a metal. Then we advanced on to using electric furnaces, as we're doing here. Uh, then we advanced to electric furnaces and and, um, allo and, and ore purification. So in, in here you can see we're bringing in, in this particular case, it's the rare metals, because all the other ones have been moved off elsewhere. But the idea is you bring in the raw rare metal, so that's the ore, you mix it with an acid, and it and the acid type varies based on the metal, and then that produces the enriched version of that ore, uh, which allows you to then, which can then be processed in the furnaces up here, like this, and that gets you a decent amount more out than you would if you just, if you just cooked up the ore. The next sort of step and a half is when you then go, oh, actually, I've invented modules. Let's go and put loads of those into all of the machines. So along here, you can see we've got um, we've got productivity modules and speed modules. Up here, we've got more productivity modules and then speed modules from a beacon. There are better ways to design this, but this was a sort of a sort of a retrofitting when we when we already had the system here, but suddenly needed a bit more rare metal coming through than we than we had available. So I boost, boosted it like this. But this is the idea. This is sort of the next step. Then after that, we did some major rebuilds, and we've got. Uh, let's try and find a suitable smeltery. So up here, for example, this is this is the um, the next level or the cu our current generation of iron smelteries. And as you can see down here, we're bringing in bringing in the iron ore, and that's then being processed in these chemical plants into enriched iron ore, and that requires the sulfuric acid that you can see here. And again, and we're then feeding it into these industrial furnaces along with pyroflux, um, and that's made, which is made from vulcanite, which I shall talk about later. And that allows us to make molten iron. The molten iron can then be converted into either steel ingots if you add in a bit of um, uh, charcoal, I think that probably is, or maybe coke, or into iron ingots if you just if you just put dump it straight into the in, into the casting machines. And so that then allows you to produce ingots. And ingots can um, are, are, are fantastic, but it's not only does it give you an extra boost in the productivity um, from doing the uh, to, from doing the allowing you to put productivity modules into your um, in furnaces and um, and having an extra step in there. I think it also gives you a boost to the amount of um, in ingots you get out based on the or the amount of plates you get out of an ingot. But also very very valuably, it allows you to cram far far more ingots into any sort of or far far more metal into any sort of storage system. Because over here you can see we have. Um, we have uh, ingots stacking up to 50, we have plates stacking up to 100, okay, so it sounds like the uh, the plates are better, except that each ingot can be turned into 10 plates, and so therefore each one of these ingots, you get you get 50 of them in a stack, which can, you can turn that into 500 plates per stack, whereas over here you only get 100 plates. So when you're transporting stuff around, whether it's by train or by rocket or by delivery cannon or by whatever, it's far more efficient to do that as ingots than it is to do it as plates. Um, but that's got a little bit away, a little bit away from what I was really talking about with this. We've we've got all these systems for um, for making for making the um, the iron or the or the metals in much much more efficient ways. And similarly over here, we're doing exactly the same thing with copper, where we're bringing in the ore and then enriching it here with acid and then smelting it into molten copper, which we're then turning into ingots. And as you can see, we've currently got actually quite a lot of it, and we seem the sap factory seems to be fairly satisfied at the moment. 
And of course, everything around here is fully moduled up. We've got, admittedly, it's only tier two modules at the moment, so there's room for some upgrades in there. But we've got we've got the the productivity modules in here, giving us in this particular this particular step a boost of plus forty five percent. So we're getting an almost extra half free because there's room for so many modules in these in these big industrial furnaces. And if we can bump these up to tier three modules, then that'll probably get us another six percent. So we will then literally getting be getting more than fifty percent extra free from this one step alone plus another another boost of 18% here and unfortunately no boost here because you can't put productivity modules into casting machines but still you get a fantastic boost out, out of this uh, for the for the mere price of having to use lots and lots of vulcanite to get the pyroflux this is the current state of the art at the moment this is this is a, as advanced as our systems get however in the in the future, we may we may do some rebuilds and probably starting off with the rare metal um, smeltery because that is currently the the oldest and most out of date system. What we'll probably end up doing there. We've recently researched a new type of furnace. We've got the where are they? We've got the advanced furnace, which comes from Crastorio Two. Previously, we've gone from stone furnaces, which are cheap and easy to make but not very good to steel furnaces which are basically the same but faster then onto electric furnaces which you can put modules in uh, then industrial furnaces which you can put more modules in and also pyroflux if the recipe support it so that makes it even even better and the advanced furnaces I'm not sure about I would expect them to allow you to then put more modules in as well just to boost the thing even further. Um, however, I've heard from people in the comments section or on uh, Discord that actually the advanced furnaces don't take more modules than the industrial furnaces. So maybe they're not going to be that valuable, but they are a lot faster. Um, as you can see, they're twice, literally, they are twice as fast. So we may decide it's worth switching over to those, although they do require quite a lot of exotic um, components that we haven't actually built yet. So we, we shall see about that. Uh, the other thing we can do now is put in the, the wide area beacons, so instead of allowing you to put in the 8 modules you get in a basic beacon, we can now put 15 modules into a, into a wide area beacon, and that means we can make these machines run significantly faster, and that means we need fewer productivity modules in them, so I suppose that would be a reason to use the advanced furnaces. Uh, the thing about this is that, if you, is that modules are expensive, especially the higher tier ones, so if you can if you can have twice as many speed modules affecting your furnace and have your furnace be twice as fast then you'll only need a quarter roughly a quarter as many furnaces maybe slightly more than that um, and that means you're going to, only going to be using a quarter as many of the productivity modules which are the really expensive ones you'll be using and you may then end up finding you using slightly fewer speed modules because the uh, the wide area beacons, if I grab one here, you can see that, okay, it's bigger, but it also has a much bigger coverage area. So if I put if I put one here, right in, in this gap, this would actually affect all of the all of the um, the furnaces in this in this in the in these four columns, and that would mean that uh, we'd be using yes, there'd be twice as many modules in each beacon but you'd only need a quarter of as many of them. And if you put in slightly more intelligence into the design than just saying, yes, I'll drop one into the middle of this already existing build, you'd be able to use it, you'd be able to get even more um, efficiency out of the out of the way you're using the modules. So going over to beacons and using the speed beacons and then using the more advanced speed beacons can save you quite large numbers of modules in the long run. Um, so we uh, allowing us to use maybe a quarter of the number of productivity modules, a quarter of the number of the speed modules. And because each next tier of module takes two of the previous, tier, that means we could fairly realistically, for not too much more in the way of resources, we could start putting in tier 4 um, uh, productivity modules into here, and that would get us almost, that would potentially double the amount of extra productivity we're getting, bringing it up to literally twice as much coming out of the other end. So I think that's going to be very, very worth doing, but it is going to be quite a big uh, time investment and, and require quite a lot of effort to, to build all of that up. The other part of that upgrade is that we're currently researching a new type of chemical plant. So we haven't actually got these yet, but once we do, again, these are significantly faster. There's a, there's a speed of eight there, and I believe you can get, and I believe with these ones, you definitely can put more modules in than you can with the old traditional chemical plants. So I'm going to guess that we'll go from having, instead of, instead of it being three, it's going to be five or six, um, and it's going to be eight times as fast. So upgrading to those is going to give us an enormous boost in the amount of um, throughput we can have from these, especially if you then consider we can we can use the wide area beacons on them as well. So even though we have currently gone to quite a high level of um, 
uh, of production over here, and we, we're doing things that you can't do even consider in uh, Vanilla Factorio. There's still quite a long way to go, and there's at least one more big upgrade we can we can do and get a lot more. Uh, and that essentially that'll just allow us to get a lot more output for the amount of input we put in, and therefore we won't have to do as much mining. We won't have to bother the core mining systems as much. We'll be able to put all of our effort into going on and doing more advanced sciences instead of worrying about where all of the resources are coming from. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Additionally, thinking of all of the uh, the upgrades we've been building and things we've been moving off the off the bus. We've got a system down here that's producing um, producing green circuits and this is also quite old fashioned. As you can see there are no beacons in here. There are there are modules so we have at least put in we've got um, three productivity and a speed which is it's okay. It makes it means we get more stuff out but the machines run a bit slower but to be honest we've got enough uh, we seem to have enough green circuits together that that's not a problem. Uh, similarly over here with making green circuits to make red circuits. Now this is flowing constantly so this should be upgraded. We should go in here. Um, we don't have more advanced assembly machines available yet. Now there are, they do exist. There are more advanced assembly machines that can be can be made. There is a tier 4 as well but we haven't got the, um, the capabilities to research that yet or at least if we have we haven't researched it. So at the moment the upgrades for this would be simply be better modules in the in the machines here and then beacons to speed the whole, bring the whole thing back up to full speed. So yeah, there is there is potential to expand and improve this, and similarly with the uh, blue circuits down here. As you can tell, all of these things were built before we did before we had beacons. There's quite a lot of other stuff that's been um, either moved off the bus or built off the bus. So for example, we've got a uh, we've got a battery making plant up here that's making that's making ba batteries used to be made on the bus. We pulled them off. Um, what's this? This is apparently doing weird biological things. I, I uh, we're making fertilizer over here. Okay, so I, I had no idea about that. We're making heat shield tiles, and there's there's some advanced batteries being made somewhere so there's lots of things to be moved off the bus we have a massive area over here that we've called um, module city uh, this is where we're making all of our at least all of our up to tier 3 modules so we've got tier 1 productivity modules here being fed up to make the tier 2 productivity modules and then being fed up here to make the tier 3 productivity modules and this as you can see we have we have a shortage of something hurrah what do we have a shortage of we have a shortage of red circuits okay so Making large quantities of modules gets through enormous quantities of circuits, so that's currently struggling a bit. So that's, you know, something we can look at at some point in the future. <laughs> And then all of these things that we're making off the in in our little towns are dotted around the uh, around the map are then brought on 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 the train system down to the massive drop off area we've got down here, and that allows us to so a thing is taken off the bus. Maybe it's it's green circuits, perhaps, um, or iron or the iron. For example, here's here's a good example. Iron is taken off the bus to be smelted somewhere else, and then we then bring back the um, the products of that to feed it onto the bus, so that all of the all of the systems that are running from the bus still have that throughput that supply of iron available and can still carry on running. So in theory. It's, there's there's no there's very little interruption um, when you switch over from one supply to the other. Now looking at this now, it does occur to me that there are a few other things that perhaps we should be thinking about moving off the bus, or at least redesigning if there, if there's room to make them a bit more uh, a bit more productivity moduled. Like over here, for example, we're making quite a lot of these uh, little mo little electric motors. Those are being those have been fairly heavily speed moduled to make the system run quicker. But if we put it somewhere else, if we, or if we redesign this somewhere where we have room to put in some beacons, we could have fewer machines. We could put productivity modules in them as well. And and, and then again, you're just again you're saving resources. Everywhere you put in mod these these productivity modules, you're saving resources. So it's a, it's a good idea to go through and work out what things you're using in the in the largest quantities. So for example, let's have a look back over the last ten hours. Now along here, we've got things like we're making lots and lots of copper cable. Now a lot of that is going to be going into circuits and other stuff it's, it's hard kind of hard to tell from this but a lot of that is going to already be moduled because it'll be in, in systems that will be moved away off the bus wood and sand and metal the, these things these things are all being done off bus so that all of this is all this is probably fine but if we scroll down far enough <laughs> <laughs> it is actually quite we have to scroll quite a long way down before we find anything where it's particularly relevant but here are those uh, small electric motors that I was talking about. So we're making 686 of those per minute, so about 10 a second. Maybe it would be worth boosting the productivity on those, so we get them made a bit more, a bit more efficiently, and with with uh, fewer fewer resources being required. Um, but then that said, 411,000 in 10 hours is not that much when you compare it to the 14 million copper cables or the 10 million copper plates that we're, we're making. So it would definitely help our productivity and our and our resource usage to uh, to make those more effective, more effective, more uh, more efficient. But 
Is it worth it? Would our time be better spent somewhere else? I suspect our time would probably be better spent somewhere else, like uh, upgrading the places where the, the actual metal plates are, uh, uh, are produced. And so there's not much more to say about Norvis, really. I mean, I could, I could dive into the nitty-gritty, like saying, look, we have this, we have this steady stream of um, core chunks being brought in by train from all our core miners around the, uh, around the map. Uh, they're being passed through here. We are uh, processing them. We've only got tier two productivity modules in here as well. That's, that's somewhere else that needs an upgrade. But also, it needs, it needs beacons as well to again reduce the number of those productivity modules we'd need. But a significant proportion of our, um, our resources are coming from here. You can see we've got a decent, decent amounts of iron and copper and stone and rare metals and so on. And yeah, and those are being then going off to the uh, smelteries to be turned into the uh, relevant products. But most of these, we are still topping up with uh, with other mines as well. The only one we're not doing uh, doing that with is the rare metals. And in fact, I believe if we, if we check one of these um, pulverizers down here, yes, we get the same amount of iron, copper, and rare metals coming out. So we can have if we have a look in here. I can bring up these graphs that show how much of each different type of resource has been produced. And so uh, we've got the green one along here is the, uh, is the raw rare metal. So that's that is only being produced by the pulverizers over here. Uh, and you can see that's a sort of a, that's our base amount, that's our baseline, that's the amount of these each of these resources that we produce from the pulverizers. The next one is the orange one appropriately is the copper ore. And you can see that wildly spiking up and down like this. Um, and so each of these spikes of production is one of our mines kicking in because a train's come along and grabbed a train load of it. So we've, we've needed to pull a load more out and then and then feed it and then feed it into the system. But along here, it's actually going. We're 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 able. We're producing enough from the uh, from the core fragment processing that we haven't been needing to use the mines. So that's quite impressive. We are nearly. We're producing. I'm not going to say nearly enough because you can see the differences. With is between 228,000 in an hour and 372,000 in an hour. So that's, I mean, it, it's more than 50% is coming from the core processing, but it's not, yeah, it's, it's not great. Whereas the iron ore, as you can see here, there's, it's a much higher line. It's good, steadily, all of the time, we are producing quite a lot more. So this is where all, all of our mines are running, and then some of, the, some of them kick in at a slightly higher level by the looks of it. Um, so we are producing quite a lot more iron ore than we are of anything else. So we seem to be getting through a lot of that. Um, the spikes, again, are... I'm actually not quite sure why it's this much higher. That makes it feel like there's a steady production of iron that is up here. Maybe, maybe that is some of the min miners. I'm, I, I'm honestly not quite sure. But you can see that we're getting through quite a lot more of that. And that's why we're not able to produce everything we need just from core mining at the moment. Which is a bit of a shame. But again, putting in all of the... Boosting the productivity of the um, iron smeltery would help reduce the amount of iron ore that we need to put in and, that, and while still getting the same amount of iron plates and iron ingots out at the other end. So you can see how it would be very, very valuable to us to do that. So yes, the whole point of making up, the, making this uh, this main bus and all of the technology we've been doing was so that we could start launching rockets from here and going up to, uh, going up to Norvis orbit. So let's have a look there next. Up here in, in Norbit, we, we started off in a fairly similar way. We have our main bus running along here. with It's, it's, it's a very, very similar design. You've got the, the belts running along, each one with its own resource, and then they're being broken off by the uh, in, by the splitters like this and passed up to wherever they're needed. Um, as, as usual, we've got the sort of being fed in here. So you can see we've got the low density structures and the electric motors, the red circuits, being fed in here in order to make, in this case, uh, various different types of space belts. Or over here, we're making the... Um, uh, the space science, first say space science pack. Um, we've also built, I, well rather, I say we, this is entirely my fault. <laughs> we also, I also built this sort of spur off the bus, which is for making a lot of the machines that build stuff. And this sort of started off with the theory that most things, that most machines that do things in space tend to require things like uh, assembly, space assembly machines and uh, heat shield tiles and low density structures and big electric motors and so on. So I thought, right, we'll put those along here um, and then we can have just have a row of machines that grab them all in. It turns out, though, that almost every single thing you produce has an exception in there somewhere. So the biologicals uh, require require pumps, for example, and the, the, these things, the, uh, the radiators, um, require pipes. The supercomputers, actually, that supercomputers aren't too bad. But they they require blue circuits, which weren't on there yet. These ones require actually that that one's okay. That didn't require anything weird. This one needs needed tanks, so I end up making tanks off the bus here from the from an iron supply that was flowing up. This one needed uranium fuel cells. Oh, for goodness sake! So I'm making those here as well. And then we needed uh, we needed accumulators and laser turrets. So I end up having to make the accumulators and bring up laser turrets from Norvit. So 
what started off as a nice idea where I thought, well, I'll have maybe half a dozen belts, three on each side, that's not too bad, uh, feeding the, feeding 12 different ingredients into these machines, and that'll probably cover everything. But no, every single machine requires something new. Uh, okay, this one's, just, this one's just accumulated again. Uh, this one is uh, steel beams, so I'm making those here. This one is... that one, that one, that one actually requires steel, that's a, that's a bit new. Here we required lube and chemical gel, but that was actually just to make mirrors, which I needed for the telescopes. And uh, and you can you, you can see what I mean. It, as as you go along, each it feels like almost everything requires its own special extra item, like um, lamps, for example. So we're making lamps around here somewhere that down there. And it, yeah, it it's a nice idea, but it got it got a bit silly. But it hasn't yet got so silly that we've abandoned the idea and just gone. Well, you know what? We might as well have just kept this on the bus in the first place. <laughs> So this is a sort of what I'll probably call a mini bus, which which doesn't follow any of the rules of a real bus, but is sort of just kind of clutched together and, and growing over time. So the um, the this, this is essentially is a, is what we call a mall area in that it's making it, it, mostly it's make just making buildings and things that are required for expansion. So. Uh, the, um, the 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 scaffolding that you build on the the pipes and and the and the belts and things that you build with all of the machines that do all of the um, all the building of all the science packs and things now there's a couple of exceptions we are building the um, productivity production and utility sciences here I don't I can't remember which way around they are but but those two because we started building them here before we had a train system up in space and to be honest we haven't had a need to remove them yet they're they're fairly basic so we've left them in here but in general all of the things along here are largely making infrastructure or occasionally a sort of things that have been clutched in and sort of forgotten about a little bit I should probably also mention how we're uh, getting stuff onto the bus. So we have a rocket landing pad here, and that brings up all of the supplies of basic things that we have on the Norvis bus, and a few other things besides. So basically, things that are made on Norvis all come up here in a rocket and are dropped into this uh, into this landing pad here. And from there, they're then filtered out into all of these warehouses down here. And as you can see, these are all red, well, nearly all red warehouses, and that means that the bots can come along and grab stuff out of them when it's needed, at least when the uh, when the robot bots are cooked up properly. Oh, that, that needs to be in normal mode because there we go. Then, then, then this will actually be um, uh, connected to the Roboport network. So these, the robots can come out and grab stuff from here when we when we ask for it. So, for example, at the bottom here, we've got lots of things like we've got all the inserters, and these have all been brought up from Norvis. And when you need an inserter or a pump or a pylon or whatever, a bot can come and grab it, bring it over to you, or build it wherever it, wherever it's needed. But we've also got all of the resources on here as well. So we've got imosite crystals in here, we've got blank data card and batteries and so on. And all of these things can be fed out from these warehouses onto the bus and they'll flow down to where they're needed. If you want to see a bit more information about how this um, how this whole system is it works, I actually made a video about this because I was so pleased with it. <laughs> and you can you can obviously, you can find that on the uh, on the channel and I'll link it with a card up here. We're also topping it up a little bit, so we've got um, we've got memory cards being brought in here. We've got steel and stone apparently being brought in uh, by train to here, and the idea is that those are then those that can then be fed down into the warehouse system at the top, and they'll filter down through the warehouses and be put on the bus where they're required. So the idea of this is largely that we're um, we're bringing the, these are things that are being brought from recycling areas around the base. Now, now that we've got the space elevator, one of the big things we're going to be doing is going to be switching over from using rockets to bring stuff up here to to trains, and so we'll see how that works but you'll have to come into come along to the end the next few streams to see how we do that because that's still a bit up in the air we haven't really decided what we're going to do there so once we got the uh, the basics established over here with that with our um, with our space bus and started doing at least a bit of the early sciences we were then able to research space railways and now that means we've now got this somewhat bigger system where we have essentially a spine rail running up and down the middle here with uh, spurs running off it, and each section between two of the spurs is allocated for a thing. So this one's got the, the bus in it, and yes, it is kind of full, but also, what with having this going off up here with the with the big tower of folly, uh, we're able to, we, the uh, the bus isn't really expanding, and there's quite a lot of spare space around here on the bus. So this, this whole area could probably be demolished, probably should be demolished, but even if it isn't, it could be tightened up quite a bit and, and a bit more stuff put in here if we, if we end up needing it. So I'm not too worried about this basically filling its space. Then we've got biological science over here, we've got recycling here, energy science, uh, Astro science, material science. Wow, material science is getting a bit big. I, I blame Mike, Mike's love for overbuilding for that. <laughs> and then the actual science park where the science itself gets done. And these all follow more or less the same sort of layout. I'll show you um, Astro first because it's that's the one I did and therefore I'm the most familiar with it. 
But each of these areas have an area, have a thermofluid handling area, which looks something like this, where you've got a load of radiators that are chilling down the thermofluid um, to, to be, to be a cool thermofluid, and then again to cold thermofluid, and then again to super chilled thermofluid. Um, I've been putting in lots and lots of beacons and modules in all of this because it's, with Astro, you get through crazy amounts of thermofluid. I mean, really ridiculous amounts. So I've had to do quite a lot of uh, redesigns on this to get it to run fast enough. But it is now, and we've got, we've now got all of the, uh, all the thermofluid we could want. It's all, this is now running nicely. And then you'll typically have uh, something that makes an input you need for your for your science. So for Astro, for example, it's these blank observation frames. For material, it might be the um, the testing packs. For energy, it's perhaps the, um, the, 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 the some of the Holmium cables or something like that. And for bio biological, it's it's about twenty thousand different types of goo. So you make those. You then feed them down through the various machines that do the science. In this case, we have telescopes to expose the frames. Then these orrery uh, astrometric facilities to turn those exposed frames into actual data. And all of that requires these data cards to be fed in. And that is currently something we have a bit of a shortage of, but oh well. Uh, yeah, so you then feed those in. And then you, you, make, you put four types of data cards together. And that allows you to make a catalogue. These catalogues you then can then feed into, you then pass on to the next next stage of the system. And over here, as you can see, we've got two different types of catalogues. If you look closely, you can see one light, uh, light patch on that one, two light patches on this one, because that's a tier one and a tier two. There are tier threes and tier fours, which, as you will imagine, will have a third and a fourth lit up um, part, a section on the on, on the block itself. And we've, we've decided to, to feed them all into single stations and put them into a train to ship it over to where they're needed. Now, each of the uh, catalogues will be made from four types of data cards, and those typically get more and more complex as you go through them. Although I have noticed that quite often in um, in space exploration, the t first tier will be quite difficult because you need to set up a lot of new stuff. You'll probably need to go off to some ex exoplanet somewhere to mine some exotic resource. You'll need to set up all of the infrastructure like the, the, the thermofluid cooling and all of the, the handling. You'll need to learn sort of how the science works, get your, your brain around what the challenge of that science is. The second tier then tends to be more or less the same sort of thing again. So we've got, yes, we've got different types of telescopes doing the work here and there's, there's some slight differences, but basically it's the same sort of idea again. You make a different four types of uh, science uh, data card, put them into catalogues and that gets fed off. The third tier usually has it's, it's then sort of same, similar to the second tier, but again, a little bit harder, a little bit more so to make it a bit more challenging. And then the fourth tier will usually throw in a bit of a curveball. So the, uh, the the first tier is probably the is, is quite hard. The second and third tier is not so bad. And then the fourth tier will then be a, a bit of a final challenge to uh, to make you make you struggle because you know it's supposed to be the, the end the the end part of the uh, the culmination of that type of science. The other sciences are fairly similar. Let's look at Mike's. So over here, you can see we've got the material science testing packs being made. That's these uh, little boxes of um, orange goodness that take in a million different ingredients. And that's the, that and the scrap disposal is the challenge of this science pack. Uh, those are all then fed through. Again, in the same way, they're fed through machines, fed through machines. They produce four different types of data cards, which you feed into a machine here, and it'll make the catalogues. And then and then for science tier two, you do the same thing again, but with a slightly, slightly more complicated way. So in this case, it's instead of doing it against iridium plates, you do the science against iridium girders. So you need to do an extra step of processing there. The um, the science is, is then going to be a little bit harder, um, and and, and it's, yeah, it generally it, it 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 escalates gradually. But it's the same sort of you're doing the same sort of thing over and over again to for this with um, more and more exciting results at the end of it. So all of those catalogs then get fed into fed into trains down here, as I was saying. So over here, Mike has been Mike has been busy. He's got us up to he's got up to tier three. We can look in here. We've got we, and the way we've decided to do this is we'll use one train for each type of science. So this is all of the material science catalogues and you've got a row of each of the first three will be fed into this train when you've got all of those the train will depart it will head all the way over here to the science area and okay i've, I've zoomed on the here is the astro train in the station and as you can see it's got the same sort of thing it's got the first two types of catalogues in there and those are being unloaded and we're, we're, we reckon on having a maximum of quite a lot here about 2000 that's, that's, that's quite a lot uh, 2000 of each type of catalog in these in these warehouses those then get fed out down here where we turn them into the next stage of science, which is these insights, the uh, the blue, the cylinders. So you go from cubes to cylinders, and the more different types of cubes you use, the better these, the the, the cheaper it is to make the cylinders. So you might go from use, getting I don't know two two catalog two, two insights out for every catalog you put in if it's just tier one, to maybe getting three for each one. So a total of six if you feed in one of each catalog. So uh, let's see if those numbers are realistic. Uh, yeah, we're okay. So we're feeding in one of each, and we're getting out eight on the other side. So the the efficiency goes up and up as you put in more and more different types of uh, catalog. 
the catalogs then get feed, fed into the supercomputers up here, and uh, and those are turned into the gold data cards, which is the significant data. And once again, the more different types of um, insight you feed in there, the more efficient it is to produce a significant data. So you want to keep you want to keep using as many of those as you can, just to keep it just to get the maximum output for your input. At the moment, we seem to be short of the green insight, so we're um, we're, we're struggling a little bit here, but otherwise not going too badly. And so you can see here, you have you have very much a choice when you're playing space exploration. You can either decide to go deep into one particular type of science. So you can say, go, well, I'm going to put in all of the effort into astro and get and get all of the astro sciences done, or lots of the astro science done, and that's going to make this stage more efficient. And you know, if I'm already working on astro, I might as well keep at it. Or you can go, well, I think I'll start off, I'll do the, all the tier ones first, because that's going to be reasonably easy, and that's going to get me the, a big spread of technologies to play with, because I want the trains, and then I want to get spaceships, and I want to get this and that and the other. So I want to do a balanced research across all of them. And that allows you to then go in and do the more efficient recipes over here. So you've got that, you've always got that choice to make as, as, as to which one you go for. Now, because we're playing with four people, we've each gone for one flavour of science, so it's um, it's kind of, the, the, it's, it's slightly moot. We're uh, we're each working on a different one in in parallel. So, uh, but on the on the other hand, that does mean we each have a science to work on. Uh, that isn't too dependent on what the other people have been doing. Although we have been clamouring at Mike to get the um, the space elevator research done and clamouring at me to get the space spaceship research done. So, you know, we, there's there's a certain amount of demand from um, or, or um, encouragement from the other players to get the text finished. So once you've got your uh, significant data, you can feed then feed them and the insights and the catalogues into science into the actual science pack production. So over here, I've got all of these arrayed on a, on a single row because I uh, I came up with this design and I thought it was really quite quite neat, so I've stuck with it. Uh, producing producing a science pack requires you to bring in the catalogue, the insight, the catalogue for that particular generation or tier of science pack, the insight for that colour of science, a significant data, which is the same for everything, and then an exotic material of some sort. In this case, it's beryllium plates. And those then get turned into the appropriate science pack and uh, a load of junk data cards that get fed, dumped out onto the disposal system. You then want to move, when you move on to the tier two, you need a, a modified version of the exotic material. So here we've gone from beryllium plate, which is just chop up a beryllium ingot, to a beryllium pole, which is take a beryllium plate and wrap it round an iron pole. So it requires an extra step to make those. But then again, you've got the significant data. This time it's catalog two. Uh, again, the same same sort of insights for the uh, for the blue a uh, blue insight, and also the astro science pack one. So what? So each each end of each next tier requires the previous tier science packs. So you end up if you, you end up still needing the tier ones even when you moved on to sciences that only require tier two. So everything you do continue to need absolutely everything. So there's a lot of stuff goes into the into the later tier science packs. But then those can be fed off along a belt over here where they will then go into our science labs. And up here we are attempting to science, but we've run out of something. Uh, which one is it we've run out of? Bio, bio 2. Okay, so we need um, we need some more biological 2 science packs to finish off this advanced chemical plant. Um, and we've got we've got two research labs up here. That seems to probably be enough. We've put in tier 4 productivity modules because that's the best we can afford we can make at the moment. And you'll notice that uh, and, and the idea is that you always want to have the absolute best um, productivity modules you can in your space in in your labs because they were because the labs are the culmination of absolutely everything and the, so there's an enormous, enormous quantities of resource going into making these all these little science packs that go in here. And so if you can make those go twice as far, and we've got a plus 70% boost on this, so we're making them go almost twice as far. If you can make them go twice as far, then that ripples back all the way up through absolutely everything else that's happening in your factory. Uh, and, and because the massive, massive majority of your... Um, of your resource usage is going to be going towards making these science packs. So this is the very first place where you should always have the absolute best cutting edge productivity modules. It doesn't matter how expensive they are, it's worth it's totally worth making them. So all of these science areas produce lots and lots of miscellaneous rubbish, so we say, stuff that they don't they don't want. So here for example you can see this these are some perfectly good data cards that are being sent away because there is a system up here when we're making the um, when we're making the significant data, it outputs 28 blank data cards for every eight significant data it makes. So those need to go somewhere. We need a few of them around here. So we've got a couple of belts here that are hanging on to some of them, but most of them are just un unneeded. So they're getting dumped on out onto this disposal belt here. Another good example of this is the material science over here. Um, or at least it would it would be a good example, except the whole thing is ground to a halt. But yeah, all of these they dump 
dump out scrap and junk and rubbish onto these belts that run down the middle here. And we've got this huge disposal system that runs all the way up the middle of the um, the railway system over to here. And that brings all of these things. Like here we've got data cards, junk data cards. There's a bit of contaminated scrap in there. There's some clean scrap coming around here. And that all gets dumped into here. And this is our scrap disposal system. And it all comes, it all filters down through here. And in, in, in each at each step, we filter out particular things. So for example here, we're filtering out the junk data cards in order to reformat them. Then down here, we're filtering out the broken data cards from the uh, data card reformatting to turn that into scrap. Then down here, we're filtering out all of the scrap that comes in in order to reprocess it down into ores and stone. That These can then be uh, cooked up and ready to be uh, reused as other uh, for other things, for, to go back into, back into the system, back into the factory, allowing it to, to, to flow back through. And looking at this, yes, here we go. This is another place that produces iron, copper, and and uh, raw rare metals. So this is going to be part of what's been throwing off the uh, the the ore comparison I looked at earlier. Now, because there's twice as much iron and copper being produced here as there is rare metal, um, that's going to have a bit of an effect on those graphs. But uh, it's not enough to to, to solve to, to explain why that iron had seemed to have such a much higher. Uh, a baseline level, but anyway, that's all being filtered through. We're cooking that up into into the metals, and those are then able to those could be then be shipped out around the factory up here in space to go and be reused for whatever. A lot of them are going over to the material science area to be turned into the material testing packs. Some of it's being used for whatever else. The glass is probably going off to be made into mirrors. Who knows? But again, and then it all and then the rubbish carries on down here. We've got some contaminated scrap that goes into the cleaning system here, and then eventually we make we, we turn that into bio goo that can be taken away. The barrel, anything that comes in in barrels, so the contaminated bio sludge or the contaminated cosmic water can come in here and be emptied out and fed into the system. So essentially we've got all of the junk that's produced by the factory that the factory that that particular area of the factory doesn't want the theory is it can be just chucked onto these bells and it'll be brought over here filtered through sorted sorted out cleaned and made ready to be taken away back and be used for something something useful down here we are also making things like cosmic water um, chemical gel thermofluid and the um, and many 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 uh, I was gonna say many 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 uh, memory cards uh, data cards as well except this is also suffering from the shortage of red um, uh, red circuits that we spotted earlier so that's gonna need a big boost and then all of these are fed out into the train system where they can then be taken off to wherever they're needed so as you've seen there's lots going on up here in Norbit and that's been a fairly quick overview of it I've probably gone into too much detail but never mind I hope it's all been interesting I'm going to split this summary here because it's already rather long and in tomorrow's video we'll take a look at the rest of the solar system and think about the future a bit more. Then on Monday we'll have the first stream of series 3. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you there. Bye bye.